With that, I think we ought to come and uh, get ourselves back into Bible study as we come tonight to the sixth chapter of Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews chapter six is one of those passages which has been down through the years, very hotly contested. And uh, tonight I'm gonna slow down just a little bit and just cover uh, the first eight verses. Perhaps we'll get a verse or two beyond that, but really, these uh, eight verses. And I want to start out just reading these eight verses and commenting just a little bit, and then let's go back. But these are the verses that, uh, in fact, here in my New American Standard, that it even has a, a little uh, title given here. It says, The Peril of Falling Away. And there are a lot of people that have read these verses and been very concerned about whether or not they, they could lose their salvation. So let's read the context, and then let's go back and look at it. It, uh, it says, I'll, I'll put this on the screen for you for a moment, but I just want to look straight into the uh, passage of Scripture. you got your Bible there, and uh, you take a look at it. And it says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and from faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, here's where we get into some real con controversial material. They've once been enlightened. They have tasted of the heavenly gift. They've been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And they have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those whose uh, sake it is called, receives its blessings from God. But if it, that is, if that ground yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. Well, you can imagine how if you misuse those, those become very frightening uh, passages of Scripture, very frightening verses, because it sure sounds like at first read, we're talking here about one who has tasted of the heavenly calling, of the heavenly gift. They have partook of the Holy Spirit, and then they turn away, and there's no chance of repentance. Well, let's uh, get into these uh, verses of scripture and just begin to look at it here tonight as uh, we begin to uh, take uh, place in what uh, we're, we're uh, doing here and look at uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Now let me remind you what you've got on the screen here. We've got uh, the King James Version on the left, the New American Standard on the right, and the Greek in the middle. And I'm going to bring these up to size so that uh, you at home can see them on the screen well. And uh, let me say to you that uh, for the sake of some of you who use Lagos and you you uh, don't want to spend a fortune on it, you can get the starter kit. And then I've switched interlinears. Uh, this uh, interlinear literal translation of the Greek New Testament by Newberry. Uh, it doesn't come with a starter kit, but you can buy it for $29 and you can do everything I'm doing here with the lowest starter kit and the $29 add-on for the Greek. And uh, that'll get you a, a, a very good start in Logos if you're interested in that. And don't do it without uh, checking with me because I got a coupon to give you 15% off of uh, that uh, if you are interested in that. Someday I'll tell you what all that color coding means in the middle, but it helps me to make sure I got the subject and verbs and uh, masculine and feminine and all direct objects and indirect objects and all that uh, put together very well. So. Let's uh, look, first of all, at these uh, first three verses. And uh, uh, this, this letter, the first three verses anyway, is about moving on. And this is what the writer is doing when he says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ. And uh, as we uh, just begin to look at this, uh, he is, uh, he, he's leaving it. Now, you might notice in leaving here, if you were to look at the Interlinear. By the way, one of the things I like about this interlinear is it's based upon the Textus Receptus. That means it matches the King James Version, and it is the better uh, text of the Greek. But uh, look, uh, look right here. And again, let me uh, make this just a little bit larger for you. But here it is right here. Having left, having left, not uh, picking up and leaving, but having left, 
uh, we should go on. If you look at this, having left, what should we do? We should go on. And uh, this is in the aorist, which is typically in past tense. And this, uh, as it's done here, it's, uh, it's true in this uh, past tense form. Uh, but Greek doesn't have, as English does, Greek doesn't have past, present, and future. Uh, Greek uh, uh, has uh, at a moment in time. And whenever it's an aorist, it, it means it happens uh, after whatever, excuse me, it, it, has, it has been done and completed before whatever the main verb is. And so having left is what is done before we go on. And so here the author comes and he says, hey, having left. Now I'm convinced that this is what the author says I have done. I have left. Uh, this is what I've done, and I want you to join me, he says. Uh, and uh, if we uh, begin to, uh, for example, uh, look at this, and uh, we see that it's uh, typically translated leaving, and yet if we did a, a morphological search on this uh, particular word in the exact same form that it is, then you uh, find here that it comes out uh, 15 times in the Bible, and they, you notice they left their nets, they left their boats, they're leaving him, they left him, they left their nets, they, uh, they, they, they left him, left him, le leaving him, left him, they abandon him, and they're leaving him. And so this is in the New American Standard, and uh, if we uh, switch that over to the King James, you'd see very much the same thing, that this is something that has already taken place. And so in one sense, the author is saying, hey, look, Hebrews, I've moved on. I, I have left it. And I want you to notice something very strong about this particular word. Uh, and and uh, this, this word for having left, it's a fiamy. And uh, let's see what happens if we bring up the Strong's Concordance on it and uh, just uh, look at uh, what it has to say. It's uh, rather a long one, but it is to, to leave. It's often used to, uh, to forget, but it is, it's to send away or uh, notice this one right here, uh, to go away or to depart uh, or he down here to disregard is, uh, is, is the, uh, the word that is uh, used here in Strong's. Now, I want you to uh, come back to the 14 times that it's used in this particular manner, and I want you to take for just a moment the word abandoned, because this is what it really means. It is, it is that I have completely sent it off, is the word. I've completely sent it away. I have nothing yet left to do with it. And and you, you need to get this word. I'm convinced it's a very important word, this leaving. What does this mean, leaving? Uh, leaving the elementary teachings beside. And I want to propose to you, though it may be worry you here for just a moment till we finish it. I want to propose to you that leaving here literally means to abandon. He has abandoned what New American Standard then says are the elementary teachings of Christ and what King James says are the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, if I come on and I tell you, I've abandoned the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You would say, wait a minute, I'm changing the channel. I'm getting on to something else. I'm finding me another Bible study teacher. If you have abandoned the elementary teachings of Jesus Christ, this is wrong. And yet that's exactly what this says when it's incorrectly translated, as we're going to see here. We need to be careful and we need to get this word leaving. It means gone. Now, let me show you what I mean as we look at these uh, four time, 14 times as we come along uh, in here, and let's just substitute the word abandon here, right, uh, right here if we could. Matthew uh, 4, chapter 20, it says, they abandoned their nets and followed him. Verse 22, and immediately they abandoned their ship and their father, and they followed him. Matthew uh, 22, 22, when they heard these words, they marveled and they abandoned him and went away. That's talking about people leaving Jesus. 26 verse 5, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples abandoned him and they fled. Now, when you get into Mark, you have uh, some of the repeat of these th same things that they abandoned their net. They abandoned their father, uh, Zebedee, 
and uh, they abandoned the multitude. Uh, they abandoned the commandments. They, uh, they, they, they in uh, 14 verse 50, they abandoned him and fled. That's the apostles again. You see it in Luke 5, 11. Uh, the, dis the, the disciples, when they had uh, brought their ships to land, they abandoned all and they, f and they followed him. Or verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 30 where it says that Jesus answering uh, said a certain man came down from Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounding him they abandoned him leaving him half dead Romans chapter 1 verse 27 is a verse about homosexuality and it says and likewise the men abandoning the natural use of the woman burned in their lust towards one another and then we come to the last use of it in the New Testament in this format Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 therefore abandoning the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Do you see how strong this word is? The writer of the book of Hebrews is either encouraging them to do something heretical or we're reading it wrong. And I think you know which the answer is there. Can the writer of the book of Hebrews be encouraging them to do heresy? No, he can't. And so, it uh, comes up here that, again, as you look, look at it uh, here in the New American Standard, it says, therefore, abandoning, totally departing from, as uh, we come over here, having left uh, the beginning of the Christ discourse, abandoning the elementary teachings of Christ, uh, let, let, us, uh, l let us go on then, not laying again a foundation. Now, I do believe that what we have here is, uh, is, is, a, is, is twofold. One, it's the author telling what he's done. I have abandoned certain things that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. I've left them. I have forsook them. They are no more a part of my life or doctrine than, than, uh, than is, uh, you know, the man in the moon, whatever it may be. I am done with those things. I've moved on. And then he says, hey, you should do it with me. We should all go on this journey. We should all get away from these things. It's time for all of us to move on to some, 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 uh, some, some different things. In fact, uh, I, uh, I put on the outline there that uh, we should uh, go on to some deeper subjects. I'd uh, cross that out. Uh, how's this? I'll just take my pen right uh, here and cross it out. We should go on to deeper subjects. Actually, it's not deeper subjects they're going on to. Uh, they're going on uh, actually to a, a different set of doctrine. To, they're going on to something different indeed. And uh, so, they, he comes together and he says, hey, we're going to abandon. Now, let's uh, come back and look into the scripture that we have. And I want you, first of all, to notice here in the Greek, just a very literal translation where it says, wherefore, having left the... Uh, of the beginning of the Christ discourse. Now, that's not good English. It's great Greek. Having left the of the beginning of the Christ discourse. You may notice in the Newberry Interlinear, it's got some little numbers here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. And that helps the English reader to put that in order. So having left the discourse, number one, of the beginning of the Christ. This is what he's left. The, the, the speech, the word, the discourse of the beginning of the Christ, that is the Christ is of the Messiah, to the full growth, we should go on, not again, laying a foundation. Let me go here to the Young's literal translation, which often uh, helps uh, uh, translate the Greek very well. And he says, wherefore, having left the word of the beginning of Christ unto perfection, we may advance. So here we are. Having left the word of the beginning of Christ. You see this. Having left the, 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 the word, the discourse of the beginning of Christ, Young's literal translation. Now, as uh, we come to that, look what King James has done with this. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now, I just have to say, I default to the King James Version, but I have to say they got it wrong here. Who would leave the, the principles of the doctrine of Christ? Uh, would you encourage anyone to do that? If you or me, I'm the pastor, I'm the teacher, and does it come to a point where I say, now, I want you to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. 
How could you do that? That's foundational, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You've got to have that. You've got to be there. And uh, what has happened here is that, uh, that honestly, they've just made a, made a bad translation. In fact, uh, if we uh, can, let's uh, jump up a few verses uh, to chapter 5, verse 12. And here... Uh, you notice uh, it says, I'm going to jump back over here to the uh, New American Standard, uh, and it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the, ele the elementary principles of the oracles of God. Or in uh, King James, the first principles of the oracles of God. Now, uh, this uh, particular word, uh, principles here, uh, the, the, the principles of the oracles of God. That uh, word uh, principles is, uh, uh, is uh, right over here in the Greek, it's elements, the elements. Uh, and uh, you, you see it right here, stokeia. And just take that, that's principles, that's elements. Now, those elements are, that's a word that, that meant the basic principles or elements of, uh, of anything, uh, of, of, of life. In fact, uh, we can take a, a quick look. I believe it's Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. And uh, we see that again when it says, uh, after you have known God, or rather known God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements. Now, you notice right here, there's that same word, stokeia, elements. Uh, so, to uh, get back to verse 12, uh, the first elements. Now, in fact, I want you to look uh, over here again into uh, the Greek and uh, let, uh, let me find where we are here. Uh, here we are. Uh, the, the elements of the beginning, the elements of the RK. Uh, and so the, the, the principles here is elements or stoake. Now let's jump back down to chapter six, verse one, where it says leaving the principles. Remember three verses, it said elementary principles. Now it says leaving the principles. And yet when you, uh, when, when you come over here, uh, what is it uh, that they have left? Where do you find in the Greek here, where do you find that word stokeia or any of this elements or principles? You don't. Closest thing you get to is this word right here, log on, the discourse. Leading the discourse, the speech, the talk about. There's no principles here. Uh, and it says, leading the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And uh, in fact, uh, let's uh, just uh, pull the, uh, the Greek right up here and uh, see how they've come. They've taken uh, the word uh, arches here, the beginning. Leaving the beginning, they've made that the principles. And the doctrine they got from uh, logos, logon. Uh, let's just uh, happen to see what they do in other places uh, with this particular word. And um, as uh, we see, it is, I'm going to try to narrow that down just a little bit um, by getting it in exactly the same format. And it still didn't do very well because we got 134 times it's used here. However, I'm sure as you look here, the word, the saying, the word, the saying, the words, the accounts, uh, my, my hunch is, and uh, there are too many to look at uh, closely, but there we see the Hebrews one where it's doctrine of Christ. My hunch is that is the only time out of 134 times that that they translated this as doctrine. Now, the problem is it's not doctrine. You don't leave any doctrine. All doctrine is essential to you. And you've got to have that. Now, it doesn't help in the New American Standard, leaving the elementary teaching of about the Christ. Why would you want to leave? Remember, the word is abandon. Why would you want to abandon the elementary teaching of Christ? Now, again, we reinterpret this to say, well, he just means to go deeper. But that's not what this, I mean, you can't get that from the grammar. That's an interpretation, which I'm convinced is a bad interpretation as you go along with it. A uh, few other uh, 
uh, things that uh, we might uh, look at. Almost uh, there are a number of these. The New American Standard. I put these on your outline. New American Standard, New King James, uh, the Holman Christian Standard, the English Standard, the NIV. All go with some some form of the elementary teaching about Christ. In fact, uh, even uh, the New King James didn't go uh, with uh, where the King James had uh, gone, and they went rather with the elementary principles of Christ. And you notice that they uh, italicize principles because they're simply not a word under there. I'm sorry, I ought to show you that on the screen. Uh, they italicize the word principles because there's simply not a word under there. So it's the elementary, the first of Christ, the, the, the discussion, that's the word uh, of the elementary, the, 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 the first of Christ, the first uh, principles as it is given here. Now, if you have your outline, uh, if you've downloaded one of those, uh, uh, the today's English version, Good News Bible, uh, is uh, a, a pretty poor one. It says, leaving behind the first lessons of the Christian message. That makes the same error as the King James Version. Why would you want to leave it behind? In fact, isn't it the first message that you ought to hang on to? The, I mean, the Christian message, the gospel of Paul is whosoever will may come. It is by grace that you are saved, not of works. Don't ever leave that. Don't ever abandon that. If you do, you're going to build on it something dangerous. So this is why it's so important to get the translation right. And to get the translation right, you can't just swallow say, hey, that's what it says. That's what I'm going to take. No, be, go beyond. Be a good student. Study a little bit. I, I uh, said it Sunday in my sermon here at the church, you know, in the, in the founding days of our country, you could not get a college degree of any sort, of anything, without becoming uh, 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 proficient in Greek and Hebrew. Because those early religious forefathers didn't have a secular education. Everything was a sacred education, and they believed this was the truth. The truth will set you free. And if you're going to know this word, the truth, you're going to have to know Greek and Hebrew. So I really want to uh, encourage you in that regard of learning your Greek and Hebrew. And uh, you can you can do that uh, with so many easy tools right here. I mean, uh, for $250, you can buy Logos and have it right there. And and go a little deeper, study to show thyself approved. Now, someday we might uh, stand before God and say, well, I thought we were supposed to leave those elementary principles, not deal with that anymore. And he'd say, where'd you get that? Well, I read it in the English version. And he'd say, well, uh, why didn't you dig a little study and study a little more and find out what that means? Why in the world did you abandon the basic principle doctrines of Jesus Christ? That's, uh, this is a very dangerous thing. Now, the message goes ridiculously artsy on this. Here's what the message has to say. Let's leave the preschool finger painting exercise on Christ and get to a grand work of art. I, I, I just think that is so ridiculous. I get uh, so upset with the message every time I read it, and uh, mainly because it is just ridiculous is what it is. And uh, you see why I only took eight verses tonight, because we've gone uh, halfway uh, into our Bible study time. Not quite. And I've, I've got, looked at uh, less than one sentence here as we come along. So the writer says, I am leaving I'm leaving the elementary teaching about Christ. Now, what is this elementary teaching? I don't like the word elementary here because uh, as you go, it's just the beginning teaching. Now, the thing you learn right at the beginning, okay, in a sense, is that elementary or is it foundational? It's the beginning of the work of the Christ, or the, the word, excuse me, of the Christ. Now, remember, Christ is just uh, a Greek for Messiah. So he says, I've abandoned the beginning discourse, or, or the, the discourse of the beginning of the Messiah. I've left that beside. And where I want to go now is... To the, to the full growth, to the completion. This is where we ought to go. You ought to go with me. Not again laying these kinds of foundations. So literally he says, I want to go on to perfection or I want to go on to the full growth as we go along, as we make the uh, progress here. And uh, I, 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 uh, I want to, uh, uh, to, to press on toward maturity. Now, uh, to, uh, 
to to uh, to to go on to the full growth. Let us let us press on to uh, maturity, leaving the elementary things about Christ. Let us uh, press on to maturity. The word uh, press on right here. Uh, as, uh, as you see it, is a, and it's right here in the green uh, uh, here, it is a passive verb. Now, uh, do you remember what passive means? Passive uh, uh, means that it, it is, it's happening to you. Not that you're the one working it by your blood, sweat, and tears, but it's happening to you. And so, as you uh, as you begin to look at that, as a matter of fact, we could uh, take it again, and I believe, let's see here, uh, that uh, we can, well, no, I can't. Uh, that's the only time it's used. I was going to uh, try to make some comparisons there as uh, it was used. We could uh, broaden our search out uh, just a little bit and um, uh, just look at the uh, present uh, passive. And yes, here we go. Um, it is, uh, for example, First uh, Peter chapter one verse three, where it says uh, that uh, you should fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or in First Peter one twenty one, there were men who were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now that's passive. You see that it is brought to you. These men are moved. The men aren't doing the moving, but they are. Uh, it is uh, being brought to them. So literally, this really, again, is more in a, a passive sense as it comes along. And it is to, hey, uh, to, uh, to having, having left the beginning teaching about the Messiah, let, uh, let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's be carried on. Let's be taken on to maturity, not laying again a foundation. Now, the things he's about to talk about are the things then that were foundational, but things which he has, he's not going to lay again. He's not going to bring those aside. So let's begin to look and see what it is that he is going to abandon. And we'll find it's not the, the uh, principles of the doctrine of Christ. So here we go. Uh, here's what he's leaving behind here. Uh, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, all of this ties into having left. Having left, let's go on. But having left, what? Having left a foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, isn't that Paul's message? I mean, uh, you can, you can repent all day long, my friend, uh, but uh, repent of good things, repent of bad things, whatever it is you repent of, that was a part of the law. It was something that had to be done, but I'm telling you, if you try to bring that into the gospel of grace, it's, it's going to mess you up every time. And uh, well, I know this might be confusing to some who are hearing this for the first time. Say, oh, wait a minute. What do we got here? An antinomian or someone who says, let's sin so that grace may abound? No, what we've got is someone who believes that it is by grace that you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. That it is, it is that you come and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you become a Christian, you know what you have to do? You have to leave beside that repentance of dead works. I mean, uh, if you really want to dig into this to say, well, okay, what do you have to repent of and how much do you have to repent? Uh, you, can be, you can really go into silliness here as you go. For example, uh, the scripture says that uh, long hair, for example, is a shame on a man. So does that mean that, uh, uh, well, before a person can receive Jesus Christ, they've got to get a haircut. A man got to have a haircut. He's got to have short hair. I wouldn't have a problem with that, would I? Uh, what, you know, what, uh, I mean, how, what, what length then does it have to be? Is shoulder length short enough? Does it have to be uh, over the years? Where does it have to be that he has to repent of? Uh, does he have to repent of smoking? Does he have to repent of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, uh, this cuss word or that cuss word? Where, what is the degree to which he has to repent before he comes? Now, you see, you begin to turn this weave, you begin to weave a tail that begins to be awfully complicated. And he says, I'm abandoning this. I'm moving it on. Uh, this, so this uh, repentance 
of faith in, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, of from faith in dead works, uh, I'll, I'll get this right, uh, leaving the foundation of repentance from faith work, uh, fr from dead works and of faith toward God. Remember Jesus said, believe thou in God, believe also in me. You're going to have to go deeper. You're going to have to go beyond. Here's something else in verse two, he's leaving instructions about washings. Uh, if you uh, come over here to the, uh, to the, uh, um, King James, it says the doctrine of baptisms. Uh, now notice it's plural. They did it right there. And I suppose that some of the other translations probably didn't because they thought, well, what kind of baptisms is there? Except uh, that some tried to say, well, uh, here it must be talking about the water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet what does the writer here say? He says, I'm abandoning that. I am moving on to this. I'm going somewhere else in this and uh, abandoning the doctrine of baptisms. Now, the uh, problem with uh, baptisms is it is a transliteration of the word, not a translation of the word. And uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we won't spend a lot of time on it here, but I'm convinced what the writer is saying is, look, there are washings. That's what the word means. Ceremonial washings that were done in the Hebrew law. He says, I'm abandoning these things about the ceremonial washings, uh, the, you know, how you wash your hands. And when you go into the uh, mikvah, which is the, what we would call the baptism today, and don't think that baptism is some new uh, element that we dreamed up as Christians. No, it was a very Jewish element. I'll be going to December and, uh, excuse me, to Israel in December. Would love to take you. And we'll see a whole bunch of mikvot, that is baptismals from the ceremonial cleansing pools is what our Jewish friends would call them. And he says, Hey, moving beyond those instructions about the ceremonial cleansing. And uh, then he goes on to say also on the laying on of hands, uh, I'm moving beyond this, the laying on of hands. Why? Well, uh, if, if, if you take this in a Christian form, they say, well, this is ordination. And yet, uh, you know, what, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of Sunday school class has as the elementary principles something about ordination? Uh, be very rare, wouldn't it? The laying on of hands, I think, is probably talking about uh, even, for example, when the priest, and we were in the context of a high priest here in chapter 5, when the priest takes those hands and he lays them down upon the sacrifice, uh, 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 in, in a sense, uh, identifying himself and the people with that sacrifice, transferring, if you will, himself into that and saying, this sacrifice is representing my sins or our sins. He says, I am abandoning this. Furthermore, uh, the resurrection of dead and eternal judgment. Now, these things are all taught in the Hebrew scriptures. There's nothing here that you can't get from the Old Testament. You can, the, the, uh, the, the basis of the resurrection of the dead comes from Isaiah and Daniel, for example, and eternal judgment the same way. It's all in the Old Testament. You remember there was a debate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why? Because the Pharisees uh, believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did didn't believe in the resurrection, thus that very old preacher joke, that's why they're sad, you see. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Now, uh, he says, we're going to abandon these things. In other words, these are six things that have been taught in Judaism. They were the first things taught about the Messiah. And if you read the book of Leviticus at all, you know that the Leviticus is very much a teaching about the Messiah. It is a foreshadowing of the Messiah. But he says, Hebrews, it's time to leave Leviticus behind. It's time to move beyond that. Now, you and I, I mean, you might look at some of these things and say, well, wait a minute. You know, we still believe in the resurrection of the dead. Yes, we do. Not as, uh, not, we, we don't believe, we, we do not practice the book of Leviticus, do we? We do not practice the Torah, do we? We have left these things behind. Some people like to say, well, we, we practice the principle of it. I promise you, there's not an Orthodox Jew in the world that would say you're practicing the principle of it. No, 
they would say you you break every bit of it. Sometimes we talk about uh, the Christian Sabbath, and you know well, we're we're observing the Sabbath principle on Sunday. There, you will not find a Jew anywhere who would say you are observing the Sabbath principle. How in the world could you do it when you're doing it on the wrong day, even let alone all the other principles that uh, uh, that have to do with uh, with, with a Sabbath observance? So he says, hey, now it's time to move on and uh, to, to, to build on this foundation rather than lay this foundation again. Then as uh, we come along, let's jump down uh, uh, and uh, pick up. He says in verse three, this we will do if God permits. And then he comes on into verse four. And he begins in verses four and five to talk about five things which Judaism has experienced. And he's going to talk about, he's talked about moving on. Now he's going to talk about missing out. Now, uh, in the case, verse four, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, uh, as a uh, as we, we think about this, uh, the case of those who have once uh, been enlightened, uh, I, I want you to, to, to stop and consider just a moment who he's talking about here. When he, when he says, first of all, that these first teachings about the Messiah, where do you get the first teachings about the Messiah? Not in the Gospels. You get the first teachings about the Messiah in the Hebrew Scriptures. And he's tr trying to get the Hebrew people to come and accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as the nation, so that the nation will not be destroyed, so that the times of refreshing may come, or that uh, period of rest, and to press on towards maturity. And then in verse 3, this we will do. That is, we will press on to maturity is uh, the word that is given here. Now, uh, looking at verse four again, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, I wanna ask you a question here. Who are those? Those who have once been enlightened, who are they? Now, I know what we wanna say. We wanna say, well, of course, that is Christians who are about to turn away from their faith. And uh, we'll get that in our mind, and then we'll begin to prove it. We need to be careful the assumptions we make. Always question the assumptions. It's something I teach over and over. So who are those who have once been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and these things that we will look after? Now, I am convinced that it is not you. And it is not the direct recipients of the book of Hebrews. Let me explain something so you don't misunderstand here. The book of Hebrews is about the Hebrew nation, but it is to Hebrew believers. So a letter to Hebrew believers to, to them about their nation. And their nation needs to do something, and these believers need to convince their nation to do something in order that uh, they, they not neglect so great a salvation, in order that uh, the, uh, the, there not be a destruction that comes, but rather times of refreshing may come. So, those who have once been enlightened, is that me, you, possibly? Is that uh, the direct recipients, the believing Hebrews here? I'm convinced it can't be. In fact, uh, if uh, we were to jump down for just a moment to verse 9, notice what he says. But, beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. You, the direct recipients of the book of Hebrews, the believing Hebrews, we're convinced we're persuaded, uh, we're persuaded concerning you, the Greek says, beloved, of better things and of things connected with salvation, even if we're speaking like this, even though we're talking this way. So he's, he's clarifying when he gets down to verse 9 that when I say those who have once been enlightened in verse 4, I'm not talking about you. I'm convinced of different things for you. Things about salvation is what I'm convinced of you, even though I'm talking this way. Let me make sure you know I'm not talking about you, Hebrew believer, direct recipient of this book. And we can carry that over just in a very secondary way to those of us who are believers now in verses 4, 5, and 6. He is not talking about a Christian. I want to lay that down from the beginning, and then I want us to go back and uh, look at it. So, 
Coming back to verse four, those who have once been enlightened. Now, I'm convinced that uh, this is really, it's, it's Judaism or the Hebrew nation. The Hebrew nation had once been enlightened. In as a matter of fact, uh, do, you, uh, do, do you remember, and we'll just uh, look at it uh, quickly here. Do you remember what Hebrews chapter one, verse one says? That God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. Now, who did he spoke to? God spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions, in many ways. In the last days, he's spoken to us, that is the descendants of the fathers, and he did it to his son. Now, doesn't that sound like there was a uh, a uh, an enlightenment that came to the to the nation? I mean, the Hebrew nation was so enlightened that they were called the light of the world. God gave them the light so that they might shine it upon the world. This is very uh, basic Hebrew theology. So coming back, uh, he says, uh, hey, I'm not talking about the Christians here. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about those who've once been enlightened and he says, have tasted of the heavenly gift. Now, uh, I'm convinced this is a reference to, to the Hebrew nation and the Hebrew nation, more so than any other time, place, people in the world, they tasted of the heavenly gift, the Son of God living right there amongst them. We, as we'll see in a moment too, on another issue, we've got this secondary issue, but the, the literal uh, nature of this, the strong nature of the word he uses of taste here, uh, they tasted of the heavenly, uh, the heavenly gift and they were made partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now here, so many people want to come along and say, well, see, this means they're Christians. How can you be a Christian without being a partaker of the Holy Spirit? And yet I would propose to you, and we could do a study of this word uh, if we uh, had a little bit more time. And uh, what we would find is that to the, the word here to be a partaker, a partner, uh, a, a fellow companion to, uh, to, to, to be associated with or to align with this, uh, this uh, word that is used here does not mean that you have received the Holy Spirit, or, or let me say that a different way, it does not mean you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But remember the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down upon Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. Uh, uh, if we were to uh, look at that uh, particular day and we were to go to uh, Acts uh, chapter two, verse six, for example, as uh, it was said, when this sound occurred, this is the Holy Spirit coming, the crowd came together and were bewildered. Now, this is the crowd of Jerusalem. It's not just the 120. The crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They, that is the crowd, the citizens of Jerusalem, they were amazed and astonished. Aren't these all men Galileans? How is it we hear them speak in our own language. And it goes on uh, to speak about that. Now, you see what is uh, being said here is the nation was a partaker of the Holy Spirit. And then he uh, goes on to the, the next thing, not only uh, enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, but have tasted the good word of God. Indeed, they had. In fact, the oracles of God belong to whom? In Romans chapter nine, uh, it, it, I believe it's Romans chapter nine. It says that the oracles of God belong to Israel. They tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now, they tasted of the powers of the age to come. You can do a word search and look at it and you'll find that the age to come is the messianic age. It is the millennium. And what nation? on this earth, what people on this earth had a, a, an experience, a real experience. I'm not talking about something in their heart. I mean, they had the real live before their eyes, living technicolor experience of the, the powers of the age to come. 
the Holy Spirit came down and boom, there was before their eyes one display after another of the powers of the age to come. And when you study the book of Acts very carefully, as we've been doing uh, here in our church, you begin to see, hey, that is very clearly the, these, these things, these issues of the things to come. Now, take those uh, five things there, the, the once having been enlightened and tasting of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted of the good word of God and tasted of the, age, of the power of the age to come. Can these things be claimed of Christianity? Well, on one sense, you can stretch at least five out of six of them to say, well, you can claim, you, you can claim those. Have Christians uh, been enlightened? Well, uh, uh, you know, in, in that sense, uh, Jesus is the light of the world now. He's come. His light has shone upon us and all men, uh, John chapter one, verse uh, ch chapter one says. So you could take that. Have we tasted of the heavenly gift? Not like Israel did, not like the Magi did, not like those who actually saw him, but in, you could spiritualize it, take it in a secondary sense. Have we been made partakers of the Holy Spirit? Again, it's a very different way. We, we, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is not what it says here, but uh, you know, we can take that and say, okay, we're a partaker of the Holy Spirit. Uh, to taste the good word of God? Well, yeah, I, I think we can see that. And to taste of the power of the ages to come? That's one we have not experienced. Now, I'm a cessationist, and we can get into that some other day, but I don't think that we have tasted of the powers of the age to come. And that's not been our experience. So, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, is, is uh, I don't think, speaking of the Christian. Furthermore, when you look at that list of five things, where does it talk about justification by faith? Where does it talk about justification at all? Where does it talk about a salvation experience that is uh, given there? Now, what do I think these verses are? I think they're a description of the Hebrew nation, the unsaved Hebrew nation. And because of this, no other people in time has less of an excuse not to have accepted Jesus Christ as the anointed one, as did that generation of Israel. You can, you, you can say whatever you want, Romans chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 1 uh, and, and 2 about the Gentiles and that they're without excuse, but I'm telling you, if the Gentiles are without excuse because they see the fingerprint of God in creation and they ought to uh, follow that, uh, you know, to, to whom much is given, much is required, and the, the Jewish nation, the Hebrew nation, that generation of the Hebrew nation had absolutely no excuse. And so, this is what the writer of, of, of Hebrews is getting, uh, is coming at. And he's saying, hey, directly to you Hebrew believers, I'm not talking about you. I've got a different uh, word concerning you. He says in verse nine, and it's about salvation. But your nation, here's your nation. Your nation was once enlightened. It tasted of the heavenly gift. It became a partaker of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It tasted the good word of God. It has tested, uh, or excuse me, tasted the power of the ages to come. It has no excuse. So coming along then in verse six, and having fallen away, and having fallen away, let's uh, pull over here to uh, the Greek and let you see uh, this. And uh, it says, Newberry says, and who fell away? And, and, and inserting uh, or implying the, 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 the word who here, they fell away again, who fell away again uh, to renew, to repentance. This would be impossible. So uh, as, as we look at this now, uh, New American Standard inserted the word then, and uh, uh, King James, though they didn't italicize it, inserted the word if. Notice when you come over here, there's no if, there's no uh, subjunctive verb here. Uh, all of these are, uh, are, are active participles, not subjunctive. And so there's no if, it's, it's just, that's an interpretation. There's no then, that's an interpretation. They fell away, and it's impossible to renew again to repentance since they again 
crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And here is where he is uh, coming along and, uh, and, and saying uh, something very strong. In fact, this fallen away uh, really is, is in, the, uh, in, in the active tense. Uh, so we could, I've given you some scriptures that you could look up there on your outline, but literally it is, uh, hey, they, they, they walked away from it. They actively chose to, to, to renege, to be gone from it. And so having rejected with all they have, having rejected the gospel, having rejected the Messiah, what are we going to do then? Now, let me give you a little bit of an example here. It says it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance. In, in the days of the Hebrew law, if you accidentally killed someone, you inadvertently killed someone. You remember what you did? You ran to the city of refuge. And there you put your hands on the altar until the, the, uh, the, the priest could come, the Levite could come, and he could declare you safe in that city of refuge. And you remained there until the high priest died, and then you were free to go. But, which means you hoped that you didn't accidentally kill someone with a young high priest. But nonetheless, as uh, it, is, it is carried out there, the Lord uh, comes, and when, when he is being crucified, you remember what he says? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's a city of refuge for them. Peter comes along and he's preaching in Acts chapter 3. And, and he says to, to the people, what you did, you did in ignorance. You, you, you didn't know. You didn't understand it. And, and uh, I'm just going to go with the fact that Peter and our Lord are right on this. The people simply did not understand they were putting the Messiah to death. And, and uh, yet now there's a problem because now the Holy Spirit has come. They partook of the Holy Spirit. And they've tasted the word of God as it's given through the mouth of Peter who says, you did this in ignorance. Now they've got the full story. Now they see that Jesus is risen from the dead. They've seen this resurrection from the dead. They've got all this. They've got uh, everything that is given. In fact, they've even been given some samples of the age to come, the power of the age to come. Now, if you reject that, there is nobody, nobody, nobody who can say it was done out of ignorance. And so for this nation, he says, what is there that can be done? Crucify Christ all over again? No. When you did that, you did it purposefully, willfully putting him to shame, knowing all that had been done. And is, there's even the possibility uh, that uh, when, they, when they crucified, uh, excuse me, not crucified, when they stoned Stephen, that this is their manner of, uh, of, uh, of, of sending Stephen and saying, we know exactly what we're doing here. And just like we put Christ to death, we'd put Christ's followers to death. This is where we stand. We do not want Jesus to be our king. We do not want Jesus to be our Messiah. He says, there's no hope for that kind of nation. And thus uh, it comes here in this uh, really very uh, difficult uh, conclusion that we have in verses 7 and 8 when he says, For the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful for those uh, for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless, close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Now, isn't that interesting? He says the land is close to being cursed. And this, he's talking about the nation. Uh, he's saying, hey, Hebrew believers, let me tell you where your nation is. They really need to come around because time is about up. Because once they're cast out into the world, there's no hope for bringing the, the, the Messiah in. There's no hope for the Messianic age. There's no hope for the kingdom. They are gone into destruction. That particular generation, that nation, it'll be gone. It'll be a new nation born in a day that'll come back at the end of time, according to uh, Scripture. And so they are going to be sunk. They are like a land that the rain falls on it, but it doesn't bring forth a 
the blessing. It brings thorns and thistles. This is the land of Israel he's talking about. And he says, it is close to being cursed. This is his desperate. Remember in, uh, I believe it was chapter three, verse uh, one, where he says, uh, oh, excuse me, it might've been uh, chapter four. Yes, chapter four, verse one. Uh, Let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any of you should fall short of it. He says, man, we're, we're so close. That is the nation is so close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. Do you remember what the Romans did in AD 70? They burned it. And the proverb went out, what happened to this land? This land is a curse, just as the Old Testament had promised would happen if they rejected their Messiah, and indeed they did. And it ends up being burned. Now, when you burn land, what what happens to it? Does it destroy the land? No, not at all. It cleans it off, doesn't it? And eventually what happens? Another crop grows a green crop, a valuable crop, a good crop. The thorns and the thistles have been destroyed. Now we can start over again on that land. Well, with that, uh, we're going to stop right there for tonight, uh, looking at these uh, eight verses. And how about that? Our time's up anyway. And uh, I do want to answer your questions here in just a moment. And you can put the questions in on the chat box there. If you're on Meeting Burner, use the Ask a Question button. If you're on Blog Talk, use the chat box that you've got on the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you uh, want to tweet it in, at Pastor White, twitter.com slash Pastor White, or at Pastor White is uh, where you can send those questions. And I'd be happy to take it. Uh, just a, a few words. Sorry, I haven't written much uh, for you on the website. We've been doing a lot of other stuff uh, here lately. But this week, weekend, uh, there is uh, a, 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 a a broadcast coming up that'll come up uh, late Friday night or early Saturday morning, and it's about uh, demon possession. So watch the website this weekend. Ask the theologian. It's, it'll be in video format or in audio format, and those of you who listen to it on the radio, about demon possession, and then the one following that will be about uh, exorcism. So we're going to have de- demon possession, plain and simple, and exorcism, plain and simple. I hope you'll uh, check that out and uh, pass that on to those who might be interested in that. We do still have some room for you to go to Israel December 7th through the 16th. would love to talk to you about that. Randy at Randy Whiteman ministries.org. And as always, thank you for those of you who are our Club 8 and Club 360 members. You bought uh, the equipment that we got right here and the radio time and all that uh, we do on the internet. And I so much appreciate that.